Kia koutou katoa, namahi nui kia koutou katoa, um, ko Catherine Hall toko ingoa. Uh, well, greetings and welcome to this online event, Brain Health Behind the Science. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Catherine Hall and I'm the Chief Executive of Alzheimer's New Zealand. And I'm delighted to um, welcome you to this webinar and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We know it's been a pretty tough couple of weeks, particularly for those of you who are joining us from Auckland. So thank you so much for making the time. And it is a pretty special event for us because um, uh, September is World Alzheimer's Month. Uh, and in World Alzheimer's Month, we focus very much on raising awareness of dementia and, um, uh, and um, uh, working to um, uh, lift the knowledge and understanding of dementia. Sorry, I was just a bit distracted there. Um, uh, so it's wonderful to be able to have a, a webinar like this at the beginning of our Awareness Month. So thank you very much. And we do have a lot to do tonight, so let's get on with it. Uh, because you may not know that uh, the brain is um, considered to be one of the most complex uh, organisms in the universe. And tonight we're going to try to get behind that um, complexity just a little bit and learn a bit about brain health. Uh, and to help us with that, we've got some wonderful speakers um, uh, joining us tonight. Uh, Etu Mao, Nairi Kurs, Vanessa Burholt, and Sir Richard Fall. So before I introduce uh, our first speaker, though, there are just a few things I want to um, talk about in terms of the uh, webinar. The first, you've probably already worked out, you, your camera and microphone are turned off for this webinar, but we do want to hear from you. So please, if you have any questions for any of our speakers tonight, please do use the question function. And one of our staff, Lynetta Russell, uh, our Principal Advisor Services and Standards, is going to be keeping a very close eye on those questions and she'll be directing the questions to the speakers as we go through the evening. So how it's going to work is each of our speakers are going to speak in turn for a very short period and then we'll, we'll have time for questions to that speaker uh, and then we'll move on to the next speaker and if we have time at the end then we will squeeze in uh, a few more questions. So do keep those questions coming throughout the evening. Now we do like to thank our speakers and if we were doing this in person, uh, then we would be giving each of our speakers a standing ovation when they finish. But uh, of course we can't do that uh, while we're on an online event. So I would ask you to uh, join me uh, after each speaker uh, has spoken with um, uh, and thank them uh, with virtual applause. So I will um, cue you into that uh, when we're ready to do that. Uh, now we are, I think, all used to using Zoom um, by now, um, and uh, tonight we are using the Zoom webinar platform. Uh, we are, um, we've uh, had a bit of experience doing this, we have practiced, uh, we're expecting it to run smoothly, but if anything goes wrong, please bear with us, we will get it fixed very quickly because we know how frustrating it is for you. Um, and finally, just a very quick reminder to uh, all of our speakers tonight to keep your camera and your microphone turned off uh, until I ask you to turn it, um, them on. And uh, so that will just make sure that we um, uh, keep the background noise to a minimum. So now I am delighted to uh, introduce our first speaker. So Etu uh, Mao is joining us. Etu is the Senior Lecturer in the Department of Psychology at Auckland University, and he is also a Specialist Old Age Psychiatrist at Waikato University with a particular interest in dementia prevention. So um, uh, an interest relevant to tonight's topic. Last year, Etu was awarded a Health Research Council Pacific Clinical Research Training Fellowship to do a PhD in dementia cost modelling with a particular interest in uh, equitable allocation of resources for Pacific communities. Uh, and as an aside, Etu is also working uh, with us on the update of our Dementia uh, Economic Impact Report, which we'll be launching later this, um, uh, this month. So tonight, Etu is going to be talking to us about what's been happening recently uh, in um, uh, research into brain health. So Etu, I'll just get you to turn your camera and um, uh, microphone on for us, please. 
So Malo Alele, uh, Etu, wonderful to um, have you joining us um, during what I think is Tongan Language Week. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So over to you, Etu. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Catherine. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. So the brief I was given to talk about today um, was um, brain health. And what I've titled my slide as, though I've lost it, so I can't even see it on my screen, um, is body health is brain health. So really briefly, when we talk about dementia, what we're talking about is basically an umbrella term that covers a whole range of different cognitive symptoms and cognitive impairments. And then under that umbrella are a whole stack of different types of dementia. And you would have most likely heard about the common Alzheimer's type dementia. But there's also a lot of other dementias as well, and they all affect different parts of the brain, and there are probably different drivers that are causing those changes that manifest as these dementias. And that's a really important point, because to date, we don't actually have any cures for dementia. And one of the reasons for that is, just like I've said, because there's so many different types of dementia with so many different underlying causes, it's not surprising that we can't find this kind of one size fits all cure that will kind of wipe cognitive problems from anyone manifesting them. And a really good example of that is if you go to see your GP with something like a stomach ache, it could be because of the dodgy leftovers you ate, it could be because your appendix is playing up, it could be because you've got an ulcer, you've got cancer, or in more recent days, a stomach ache might mean you've got COVID. But, you know, all of those things have different causes and therefore have different treatments. The second point that's really important is that we know that while we conceptualize dementia as being this disease that somehow suddenly occurs when you get old, what the evidence is starting to show is that actually it's the changes, the small incremental changes that are happening years, even decades earlier, that are slowly creating those changes in your brain and slowly building up to a point where you manifest or you eventually show those cognitive difficulties. So where the evidence is really going now is that actually it's your life in your 40s and 50s that's going to matter most because that's when the changes start. And that's probably the other reason that medications to date haven't worked so well because a lot of the studies on medications for dementia are looking at people who already have symptoms of dementia, who already have cognitive problems. Um, and potentially the horse has already bolted then, and actually we need to be targeting much, much earlier in this course to stop the changes happening in the first place. It's not all doom and gloom though. So that blue bar that you can see at the bottom of the graph, those are countries like New Zealand and Australia and the United Kingdom, Canada, and what we've shown is that, yes, dementia numbers are climbing over time, but they're not climbing as rapidly as some other countries, which is what that red line shows. And the reason for that is because New Zealand, along with many other countries, has put in place a lot of public health measures over the last three or four decades. Measures around you know, smoking prevention, alcohol harm, the five plus a day for veggies, you know, all of the Heart Foundation um, public health measures and campaigns that have happened. And it's not surprising that, thinking about it now, that actually the rates of dementia increase in places like New Zealand isn't quite as quick because those same risk factors are the ones that are also risk factors for developing cognitive problems and subsequent dementia in later life. So the Lancet Commission, Professor Joe Livingston at University College London, her and her group came up with an initial nine risk factors and subsequently updated those to 12 risk factors that if they were prevented could potentially reduce dementia cases by about 40 percent. So I along with a couple of other colleagues got in touch with them and we ran the same numbers but for New Zealand and what was shown is that actually almost half of dementias in New Zealand are actually preventable if we target these 12 risk factors and over half are preventable, potentially for Maori and Pacific populations. 
And the prevention really falls into two main categories. The first one is reduce the damage to your brain, reduce those changes that happen that slowly cause changes in your brain that eventually build up to a point where you have cognitive symptoms. And it's no coincidence that I've chosen pictures that all have a heart in them for high blood pressure, depression, diet, smoking, diabetes, exercise, alcohol. Basically, anything that's good for your heart is going to be good for your head. And what we've shown and what's been shown overseas is that these factors are ones that will reduce your risk of dementia significantly. The other thing that we can do is build our cognitive reserve. And that's basically building your brain's ability to deal with any changes that happen. And what the evidence has shown really strongly is that the more that you are socially interactive, the more that you have a social network, that you engage with other people in community things, the higher your education, and the easier it is for you to connect with other people, and the more socially stimulating your life is, the more your brain will be able to deal with those little changes if they happen. And one of the big risk factors that's been shown overseas, and indeed with our research in New Zealand, is hearing loss because hearing fundamentally affects the way that you can engage and interact with other people and is going to therefore reduce the amount of social stimulation that you get and has been shown to have a really strong correlation with people developing cognitive symptoms in later life. But the good news of hearing is that hearing aids tend to reverse most, if not all, of that risk. So my take-home message really is Anything that's good for your heart is going to be good for your head. So targeting things like blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, diet, what Professor Kirst will talk about. But also in conjunction with that, keeping an active body, so physical exercise is really important, and keeping an active, stimulated mind. And the really important thing I think about exercise is that you don't have to be flogging yourself at the gym running marathons. What the evidence shows is that 30 minutes of exercise, a nice brisk walk four or five times a week gives you the same benefit as getting out and running 10 kilometers or going to the gym. So the overarching message for me really is there is no cure for dementia. So what we need to focus on is preventing the preventable. And in my research, what I'm really interested in is targeting people in midlife because we know that your 40s and 50s are when those brain changes start. But actually, addressing these at any point in your life, even later in life, is going to be good for your brain. Marlo Alpito, thank you very much. Marlo. Etu, thank you so much for that, um, and a, a very useful reminder to us all, I think, that um, what is good for our brains is good for our health. Um, can you just stop sharing your screen for us? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so um, please join me in saying thank you to Etu with a virtual applause. And uh, now I'll just get Lynetta Russell to turn her um, camera and uh, microphone on, and she's going to be um, directing some of your questions uh, to Etu. Are you there, Lynetta? Yes, hi. Sorry, sorry, Etu. Sorry, Catherine. And good evening, Etu. Thank you. Um, Etu, the first question for you, and it's probably linking to that midlife that you've just talked about, is there any link to menopause and hormonal changes? The short answer is we don't really know. Um, so when we did this research and when Professor Livingston did the research, the risk factors that they've listed there are the ones where they have enough evidence that they can categorically say, there is a correlation and a risk associated with them. Clearly, it's not just all 12 of these. There's a lot of other factors um, that may contribute, but for a lot of them, we just don't have quite enough evidence for them yet. 
Thank you. And, and what about hereditary factors? Yeah, hereditary factors is always a good question. Um, what I tend to say to my patients is, genetics will give you about a 7% risk of developing dementia. So that's about the same as dealing with your hearing loss. Um, you can't choose your parents, you can choose the lifestyle that you live. And there's a really, really good study that came out last year that showed that in people who had really, really high um, genetic risk factors for dementia, if they lived a healthy, active lifestyle, then their risk was actually lower than people who didn't have a family history, but lived a lifestyle that potentially had more of those risk factors. Wow, mm. interesting, isn't it? Thank you. Um, one, one other question. Um, recently, we've heard lots of publicity about the new drug called aducanumab, and which everybody is hoping will slow the progression of dementia. Sure. So a couple of questions associated with that. Why has that, this drug been so long in coming? Um, because it's, it's been 20 years since we've had anything significant in the research. And why do you think it has not been approved for use in New Zealand when so many people with dementia and their families are really hanging out for something? Right. So the few answers to that. The first is that the evidence for um, Aduhelm, I think it's uh, brand name is, isn't that great. Um, and in fact, the side effects associated with it are so high that most um, uh, researchers around the world um, and health organizations are actually pushing back on it and saying the type and number of risk factors that are involved are so high that actually they outweigh the, the small benefit that it provides. The second question around why it's been 20 years. So the way that um, Aduhelm works is that it's effectively an antibody and what it's there to do is to try and reduce inflammation because one of the theories of dementia is that actually it's this buildup of all these different byproducts of your brain production that tend to build up over time and then spread and then cause inflammation. So potentially this medication is targeting the inflammation. Um, why isn't it available in New Zealand yet? So the FDA in the US pushed it through really quickly. There's now been a lot of pushback on that. And in fact, there's now an investigation going on as to whether they approved it too quickly based on slightly dodgy science. And the fourth factor is that it's an IV infusion. So it has to go into your bloodstream. And at the moment they're charging about $50,000. Very good reason, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Look, um, I'm sorry. I'm sure that you've got lots more questions for um, Etu, uh, Lynetta, but um, we need to wrap it up now so that we can move on to our second speaker. So um, thank you again, Etu, and we will come back to you at the end if we've got time for some bonus questions. Um, but for now, thank you very much, and I'll get you to, um, uh, to turn off. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker uh, of the, this evening to you, Nairi Kurs. Now, Nairi is the inaugural Joyce Cook Chair in Aging Well at the University of Auckland, and she's also a GP at the Wellington City, uh, Wellington City Mission, Auckland City Mission, because, of course, she's in Auckland. Um, so uh, Nairi has in her career cared for a lot of people with dementia, both in primary care and in residential care, and she's also an active researcher in the space of dementia prevention and also the things that can be done to support people living with dementia to live their best possible lives. Lives. And tonight, Nairi is going to be talking to us about uh, how eating well and um, being active can uh, keep our brains healthy. So over to you, Nairi. Uh, kia ora tato. Ko Mount Peel te moanga, ko Orari te awa, ko Kouterana te whara te puna, ko Ngāti Pākehā te iwi, ko Nairi Kurs Taku Ingoa. Thank you very much for inviting me here to talk. Um, I'm quite passionate about living well, and I thought I'd talk about two different things. I talk about dementia prevention and eating well and keeping active. 
And then I talk about actually caring for people with dementia and how eating well and keeping active is important there too. So dementia prevention and brain health is, as Etu was saying, a lifetime activity. So actually childhood nutrition and childhood activity and brain growth is very important to preventing dementia in older ages. You've got to get as many brain cells as you can on board. You've got to grow your networks, you've got to grow your neurons so that you have the best chance of, of, um, of not getting dementia later. So nutrition and activity are important throughout life, but in different times in your life, they're more or less important. Physical activity is always important. So at your patterns of physical activity are often set in childhood and throughout your lifetime, keeping active and uh, being engaged in life as much as you can is very important. Now, what kind of activity? As Itu said, anything for half an hour a day, at least five days a week. It is better if you can be a little bit more vigorous at times. That seems to um, get our uh, cells and, and muscles going. And it's also really important for your brain that the kind of activity you do is sort of cognitively challenging. There's some quite interesting evidence coming out now that yes, general physical activity is important, but specific things like ballroom dancing seems to prevent dementia for a bit longer. And you can see why it's very, you need to remember long sequences of things. You need to interact with somebody else and you have to keep time. So music is important with that kind of physical activity. So cognitively challenging physical activity. And that should go on right through late life into the oldest age groups. It's never too late to get your heart rate up with some physical activity. Activity is better if it does make you huff and puff. Now, during lockdown, we've been taking our dog for a walk a lot, and I've been trying to think of physically, of cognitively challenging things to do while I'm walking the dog, and of course, talking to somebody else. So as you're walking or doing your activity, talk to somebody else. That makes it a social occasion. It makes you more, getting more brain stimulation while you're walking. Another good cognitively challenging one, if you can't manage ballroom dancing, would be to, to couple things together. So walking and talking. Team sports are always more cognitively challenging than doing something alone. And of course, a bit of a kick around with a ball is very good physical activity. A bit of sprinting, a bit of stopping. So make your activity cognitively challenging. If you haven't been a regular person doing physical activity, start low and increase slowly. But do challenge yourself to do more every day. So physical activity throughout life, very important. Now, eating well. So eating well means not eating so much in midlife because that obesity is a significant risk factor for dementia in late life. We don't quite know, well, we do know why obesity is very bad for our bodies, but for our brains, it potentially changes the way that you metabolize fats and other um, amino acids in a way that they promote inflammation. And that, as Etu said, potentially that inflammation is what gets at your brain. So trying to have a normal more body weight through life is important. But as you age, and particularly as you get over the age of 75, you don't actually want to lose weight. You want to maintain your weight. And going into 75 with a BMI of 28, which is a little bit chunky, but not overweight, is better than going into 75 with a BMI of 22, which is relatively slim. Now, this is good news for everybody because we all like to uh, a bit of a treat and that's very important in late life. Now, what is good healthy eating? In late life, protein is very important. We tend to try to do all the right things and eat less fat and less protein and more carbohydrate. But in late life, you want to change that around and take protein regularly. Protein for breakfast, protein for lunch, and some protein for dinner, rather than having it all as a dollop at the end of the day. And so that protein, what is protein? Well, proteins are, of course, meat, uh, red meat and uh, non-red meat, seafood, 
fish, and then the non-animal type proteins are things like nuts, um, pulses, which are beans and, and peas, and of course, soy protein, which is what tofu is made of. So go for that protein. You need at least one gram for every, every um, kilogram of your body weight a day. More is better. And if you want to see, so I'm 75 kilograms. I didn't tell you that. So one nice um, hand-sized piece of steak or piece of chicken is about 20 to 30 grams. So you need a couple or three of those over a daytime. Now I know my time's going, so I wanted to talk about eating and, and uh, keeping active for caring for people with dementia and for people with dementia. Physical activity and good food is very important for people with dementia. Activity in the late afternoon is an excellent way to spend those couple of hours when, that, when um, thinking is particularly difficult going out of the house and walking every day. And then the exercises that are especially good for preventing falls, that sit to stands, strengthening the lower limbs and doing some simple balance um, exercises are very important for people with dementia as they are for people, for all older people. Falls are one of the commonest causes of hospitalizations for people with dementia. Preventing falls, the commonest best therapy is sit to stands, lower leg strengthening and balance retraining. There are community uh, classes for falls prevention which are available throughout New Zealand. Look on the ACC website, ask your doctor, where can I get my class? Good for people with dementia and people without. Eating well is often difficult for people with dementia. I would really like the message to that good nutritious food should be around all the time People with dementia will respond to social cues, just as people without dementia will. We know that when people eat together, they eat 20% more than if they eat alone. It's too easy to have a piece of toast and a cup of tea when you're just by yourself. Go that extra mile. Make sure there's some vegetables on each plate. Make sure that your sources of protein are varied. And if the person with dementia is having trouble eating, then a smoothie is always a good way to go. Eating with somebody with dementia, they will follow the, they will follow along and are much more likely to eat something or eat well when they're eating with somebody else. So um, other messages, I think that uh, the whole of life is important. So just to recap, eating well and keeping active is really important throughout life. Don't forget to keep the children active, to give them lots of stimulation. Keeping that stimulation going throughout life, you can do exercise, which is cognitively challenging. Let's think of new ways to do that. And then eating well when you are older is even more important to not lose weight over age 75, because that is a significant risk factor um, for not doing so well and not aging well. Okay, that might be my seven minutes. I hope I haven't gone on too long, Catherine. Perfect timing there, Nairi. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for that reminder. Um, uh, a lot of really useful messages in there, but I think that many of us might have just locked on to the, it's okay to have the occasional <laughs> treat and don't forget ballroom dancing. Um, so, but thank you. Please uh, join me in saying thank you to Nairi and uh, Lynetta. Um, I'll get you to turn yourself on um, so that you can um, ask uh, Nairi some questions. Right. Thank you, Nairi. Nairi, um, are there any superfoods? I mean, we hear about superfoods all the time, things like turmeric and blueberries. Are there any superfoods that we can eat or particular diets that we can follow that make our brains healthier? or that if we had a dementia or a cognitive impairment would reduce the rate of it progressing? Look, that's a very, very topical question. Now, I've been reading the literature for a long time and I'm a wee bit of a purist. I like there to be significant number of trials conducted very carefully to prove that things are useful. Now, there is quite a lot of talk about the keto diet and brain health. Um, unfortunately, large trials have not been conducted and it has not been fully endorsed. Many people do like to try um, that keto diet and there's nothing against it. It is not unhealthy, but it's just not 
uh, really assured to save your brain. There is uh, lots of biological evidence that highly colored foods tend to be good for you. Blueberries, turmeric um, thing and um, raspberries. And there is a metabolic theory that goes that these help um, mop up the antioxidants and can promote brain health. There is some evidence in the laboratory, but again, it's very hard to change people's diets so they only eat brightly colored foods. <laughs> and I've been involved in a couple of longitudinal studies which have looked for the link between brightly colored foods, and particularly in late age, and better brain health. And it's not convincingly proven, but it's still quite good advice because I like blueberries and I like raspberries. So maybe that's something to um, think about. There have been various trends over the years, vitamin E, bee pollen, um, ginseng, and um, things like that have been suggested to be useful. They've generally not been highly effective in trials when you've tried to test them in a longer term looking for brain health. Many of the supplements that are available are quite expensive, and I would be more worried about people spending too much money on a particular supplement when that money might be better spent in other ways on other areas of a healthy diet. So I'm, I think I may have addressed some of those things. I might not have gotten all the aspects of that question. I think you did pretty well. That was a pretty comprehensive response. Thank you. Um, we've got another question here. Is there any research about childhood poverty and later life dementia, given the importance of diet on heart brain health? Yeah, that's a very good question. So Martin Prince is a favorite, uh, famous um, geriatric psychiatrist who has done lots of trials in middle and low income countries. One of the strongest predictors of dementia in late life in his trials was leg length, meaning short people were more likely to get dementia. Now I'm short, but I was well fed during, um, during my childhood. So nutrition in early life is how you don't grow and, you, and nutrition in early life is very important to um, brain development and uh, does and is important. And poverty in childhood doesn't necessarily mean you eat poorly. For instance, during the depression in New Zealand, the children generally had enough food and certainly rural communities in Māori who live in areas of high deprivation they did eat well during childhood. So it wasn't the poverty, it was the impact of poverty on access to good nutrition that is likely to cause dementia in late life. So that's a very good question though. And I'm very passionate about our childhood poverty issues in New Zealand, where we've got too many children growing up in poverty. And yes, we need to think about how to remedy that. It's not an easy remedy. No, it certainly isn't. And it's a very, um, a sobering reminder. So thank you very much, Nari. Now, um, I am sorry to say that we have run out of time. Uh, and again, I am sure that Lynetta has a list of questions still to ask you, but um, we do need to move on now to our next speaker. So thank you very much. Um, so our third speaker tonight is um, Vanessa Berhold. So Vanessa is a professor um, of gerontology at uh, Auckland University and um, she has a particular interest in um, uh, social isolation and um, social connection, but she's also published on uh, rurality, on dementia, on intergenerational relationships, and on um, ethnicity and migration. But tonight, um, uh, she's going to be talking to us about the importance of social connection and um, how we can help to make uh, New Zealand a little bit more uh, dementia friendly. So looking forward to hearing what you've got to share with us tonight, Vanessa, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Kia ora. Let me just share my screen. So today I've been invited to talk to you um, about social connections and brain health. And I'm a social gerontologist, so this is very fitting for me. There are several arguments for the mechanisms by which social connection, isolation or loneliness can impact on brain health. And Nairi and Etu have already touched on some of these. Uh, these are three of the different hypotheses that suggest some of the mechanisms by which this works. 
So the vascular hypothesis suggests that social connections can reduce our risk of cardiovascular disease. And so they have an indirect um, impact on brain health because cardiovascular disease is one of those risks for dementia. The stress hypothesis is fairly sim similar, but this suggests that uh, stress is responsible for increases in cortisol secretions in the brain. And over time, cortisol can lead to the loss of neurons in brain and is associated with cognitive impairment and dementia. The stress hypothesis suggests that social contact can contribute to a positive uh, emotional state that reduces stress. And we've heard a little bit already about the cognitive reserve theory. And the cognitive uh, reserve theory suggests that people who engage in a complex range of physical activities, of mental activities, and of social activities are better equipped to deal with that neuropathology of dementia. So this approach suggests that synaptogenesis, which is the development of neurons in your brain during adulthood, can be sustained into later life. And people with a greater number of neural potential neural pathways are better able to function for longer than people with fewer path uh, neural pathways despite having dementia. So social connections can influence brain health and also what is referred to as cognitive reserve. So there's very good evidence that social, um, that social uh, connections could influence our brain health. So that means we really should be really thinking about what we can do to maintain our social connections. How do we keep our connections going with our family, Fano and friends? But also, how can we manage some of those expectations about our social relationships in later life? And also, how do we manage some of those transitions associated with later life, such as leaving work when we may leave behind a big group of friends and acquaintances that we've had then? So the theories I've mentioned already tend to emphasize that individual responsibility to maintain our social relationships, to avoid loneliness and to keep good brain health. But for some people, there are certain social barriers and environmental barriers that get in the way of being able to maintain or develop new social relationships. That means there's potentially um, a spiral or could be a spiral of decline. So we've got a lack of social uh, engagement can lead to poor brain health, but at the same time, poor brain health can contribute to a lack of social connection. And I want to think for us to think about not just what we can personally do to maintain our social connections in later life and our own brain health, but what can we do as a society to maintain and help the brain health of others? And in particular, I want to focus on lonely, loneliness as one aspect of social connections. Whereas uh, social isolation is the lack or low levels of meaningful connections, loneliness is that no negative emotional experience that is a reaction to a mismatch between what we would like in terms of our quality and quantity of relationships and what we actually achieve. Now, people living with dementia um, may withdraw from social interactions. And our research has shown that people living with dementia have greater levels of loneliness than those without. But society and each of us of individuals has a role to play in tackling some of these issues. So the negative way we think about or refer to people living with dementia contributes to the stigma surrounding the disease and is likely to impact on the inclination of people to mix with others. But what else can we do to contribute to the brain health of others? If you know someone with memory loss or dementia, don't make assumptions about whether or not they want to participate, but um, offer to, to go to the cafe or do the things that you've done with them before, go to the pictures or the cinema, and keep doing the things you've always done together for as long as possible. Now, community groups, don't exclude people with a first sign of memory loss. What could you do to make things easier for people to continue to participate? Even something simple like name badges helps people avoid that embarrassment of potentially uh, forgetting friends and acquaintances' names. Now, family, friends and neighbours often offer travel assistance to shops or medical appointments. But what about offering lifts to see a friend or a family member? And how many of us experience the impatience of others in a queue, say, for example, at a shopping checkout or at an ATM? 
But if that person at the front, if that's their only social contact and they're living with dementia, just try and hold some of those negative comments in check. Because I want you to remember that the way you react, interact or treat an older person with dementia can shape their future social relationships. Discouragement can lead to more withdrawal, social withdrawal, where, there is, where encouragement might lead to better social connections. So what support can you offer to help people living with dementia to maintain their brain health through social connections? And finally, I just want to think about the environment. We need to think of the way that social, um, the environment impacts on social connections. The World Health Organization Global Action Plan describes dementia supportive communities as communities that are inclusive and that maximize the potential for people to participate. So the physical environment plays a really important role in how much freedom and choice we have over going to the places where we interact with other people. In 2018, New Zealand joined the World Health Organization's Age-Friendly Communities Initiative, but we don't know to what extent that's had an impact on people's social connections or their brain health. We need public and private spaces and public and private transport that is usable and that can facilitate us in maintaining our social connections, whether we live in a remote rural area or whether we live in a city. Now, if you work in a field that has the potential to contribute to making New Zealand a um, dementia supportive place, then use your influence to try and make those changes. Because protecting our social connections protects and contributes to the brain health of all of us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Very um, useful and timely reminder about how important it is that we all do our part, including staying close to the people that we know who are living with dementia. Um, so thank you very much. Please join me in thanking uh, Vanessa. And uh, Lynetta, do turn yourself on and um, I'm sure you've got some questions for Vanessa. I have indeed. Thank you, Vanessa. First question. Um, have you been noticing an increase um, in loneliness and dementia because of lockdown? So we're currently conducting a study at the moment um, with Gary Chung is leading it to see if there's an increase in loneliness over time. We don't have the results of that yet, but watch this space and we should be able to let you know uh, fairly shortly whether that has been the case. Do you have any sort of gut feelings about, you know, what's been happening? There seems to be a mixed bag here because some people were in contact with more people. We've also, we were also doing some work with um, caregivers during uh, lockdown. Some people were saying that they had more contact than they'd ever had before lockdown. Um, but then on the other hand, there were some people who had very few connections before going into lockdown and that opportunity to have some of the spontaneous interactions in supermarkets or out on the street were taken away from them. So I think it depends on your situation before you went into lockdown. And we really haven't got that definitive answer yet, but I hope we will be able to come up with some solutions so that we may be better prepared for future scenarios. I'm not saying we will have future scenarios, but if there are any occasions when we do have to um, change the way in which we interact with each other, that we're better prepared to deal with some of those issues. Thank you, indeed. And another question here, in your work, have you identified differences in loneliness amongst different age groups, ethnicities and genders? Okay, and, so, yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm a social gerontologist, so I don't look at loneliness in younger age groups. Um, but certainly I have looked at loneliness across different ethnicities. And what's really interesting is what is a what are the expectations for the social connections we want in later life? So I mentioned earlier that loneliness is that mismatch between what we expect and what we achieve. Um, and it's a negative emotional reaction to that. So in different cultures, there are different expectations about the types of relationships we, we want, we desire. Um, for example, the work I've done with migrant communities suggests uh, in the UK who are mainly from collectivist societies, 
suggests that there is a much more reliance on families and the expectation is that the emotional contact will be with families rather than in some of the European, more northern European countries where the expectation is to have a good mix of family and friends in your network. So for um, in the European context, if you uh, are even living with your family, but your friends fall away in later life, you may experience loneliness. Um, despite having family around you all the time. Whereas for a collectivist um, culture, for some of the migrants in the UK, having family close by was really important. So for example, if your children migrate, yet you've got close neighbors and friends, they may not compensate because they're not meeting those expectations that you have for social contact in later life. Uh, in terms of um, gender, I'll just pick up on that one, sorry. Um, there are certain life course transitions that uh, impact on loneliness. And there are two types of loneliness. One is social loneliness, which is that group of a extended group of friends and family that people connect to. And one is emotional loneliness, which is the lack of a significant other. Now, because women live longer than men are more likely to experience widowhood in later life, they're more likely to experience emotional loneliness uh, because there are more widowed um, women um, in, in, uh, in the older population. Thank you very much, Vanessa and Lynetta. I'll get you to, um, uh, to both turn off. Uh, thank you. Um, and Lynetta, if you can just mute yourself. Thank you. Um, so uh, now moving on to introduce our fourth and final speaker um, this evening, uh, Sir Richard Bull. Uh, Richard may well be known to many of you. He's had more than 40 years experience in um, brain research in New Zealand, and he's the director of the Centre for Brain Research. Uh, he is also Alzheimer's New Zealand's patron. So wonderful to have you with us tonight, uh, Richard. Richard is going to be sharing some reflections uh, with us about how far brain uh, research has, has come and where it might be going in the future. So his backdrop is um, very appropriate there, uh, Richard, and uh, over to you. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Catherine, very much. And what a wonderful privilege to join this uh, webinar tonight. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about research and the challenges of research and where, where we've got to. Um, and then from that, look at, um, you know, how can we actually take Alzheimer's forward in terms of trying to stop it and slow it down, and then give you a bit of an insurance policy, bringing together some of the uh, wonderful ideas you had from the previous three speakers about um, how to make sure we get the best value for life and try and slow down this terrible disease. So first, <laughs> comment about the research. Well, I've been in research for 40 odd years, done a lot of work on the human brain and others overseas have looked at Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And what we can say briefly about the research is that we know it is complicated. The, the pathways, there's multiple pathways in the brain which are involved with dementia. You know, dementia is without mind. You actually slowly lose your mind. And our mind is so incredibly complicated. If we can unra unravel dementia, we would unravel what the human mind is. So little wonder that it's a complicated disease. There's no single cause has been identified. So where you don't have a single cause, you can't develop a single treatment. With COVID, of course, we know what the cause is. It's, it's this virus. And therefore, if it's a particular virus, you can develop a vaccine to it. And that is, that's great. That's a, that's a treatment which is going to be very useful. We don't have that. It's not, you know, Alzheimer's is not caused by one single thing. It's not caused by a virus or a bacteria or one particular cause. So therefore, difficult to get a drug to stop that. Also, drugs have failed in a way because 99% virtually of most drug trials initially have been developed in rats. Now the rat brain is a very simple brain compared with the huge human brain. The human brain is enormously complex. We have complex behaviors, memory and all the rest of it. We far outstrip the capacity of a rat brain. So every single drug developed in the rat brain has actually failed in the human brain. And that's, that's, that's not good, but it's a reality. So we don't have a miracle cure 
for our Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So what can we turn to then? Well, you know, if you can't cure it, perhaps we could slow it down. And um, slow it down by trying to minimize all the risk factors which we know can, can contribute to the disease. Why slow it down? Well, we've worked out that we've actually done the statistics for New Zealand. If we could try and slow down the disease by two years, we would decrease the prevalence of it by 20%. If we could slow down the progression by five years, we would decrease the prevalence by 50%. In other words, you push out, you, get, you build the good years and minimize the bad years. You don't have something completely unrelated to Alzheimer's and dementia. So that is what's so powerful about delaying the disease process. Now, what's the best insurance policy then for delaying the risk factors, for, for delaying the disease progression? Well, a common thing coming through from all the speakers tonight, and it is pushed this right at the beginning, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. Now, why is that? Well, there's a huge amount of research which actually demonstrates that very clearly. Every time the heart beats, it sends blood around the whole body. Now, your brain is just 2% of your body weight. It's relatively small compared to your whole body. But coming out of the heart, directly to the brain, there's these two big arteries, one to each side of the brain, called the internal carotids. Every time your heart beats, 20% of the output goes to the brain. That's one fifth of the output, and it's only 2% of the body weight because the brain critically needs the best blood supply ever to supply oxygen, to supply nutrients, glucose, and all the other things which feed your brain cells and keep you active. And so if the pump fails, your brain fails. Things that cause heart disease will end up causing a problem with your brain. So, what are the things which are critical for looking after your heart? Physical activity is absolutely vital. Keep moving. 40 minutes a day, three or four days a week. You don't have to be a, a top Olympic athlete. You don't have to do a marathon, but exercise. Sweat it out a little bit, but do exercise you enjoy. We know from animal studies, that stressful exercise actually results in decreasing numbers of brain cells. Good exercise, which you enjoy, whether it be walking or running or whatever, will actually increase neurogenesis and increase new brain cells. The second thing, of course, for your heart health is stop smoking. The third thing is, and a number of things, Anything that affects your brain health, your heart health rather, like diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol, which clogs up the arteries, not only in your heart, but also in your brain, they should be treated. Get them under control, lower your blood pressure. Look at what's causing the high cholesterol. Treat it, your specific drugs for treating it. So look after your heart first and foremost. The second part of this insurance policy which you've heard in a number of ways from the previous speakers, is keep your brain stimulated. Writing, reading, crosswords, drawing book clubs, playing card games, music is a wonderful global stimulation of the brain. Playing a musical instrument is wonderful. Doing group singing, you've heard dancing. You heard that for Nairi is, is great. Kapahaka, doing knitting. Learning multiple languages, we know that the more languages you learn, the less the chance of getting dementia. Fascinating, isn't it? Learn new knowledge of whatever you're interested in. The third general area for this insurance policy is social interactions. You know, social interactions, we know 
you know, we know from animal studies, actually, if you put rats in cages which stimulate them, they actually make more new brain cells and slow any disease process down remarkably. Join clubs, mix with people, do voluntary work, reach outside, volunteer to help others, join church clubs. All the range of things which Vanessa talked about. So rich social interactions are critical. The other things which are, are very important, which you've also heard about, is your diet. Look at the things and eat the things which we know that the Mediterranean diet, vegetables and fruit are great. Look at the low fats, meats and so on. Follow Nye's advice in terms of how much meat you should eat. Low, have low alcohol, not high alcohol. You don't have to drink a bottle of red wine at night. Just one glass is fine. It's good. Also, treat your hearing. So you see, all these, these things put together will help give you a healthy heart, a healthy brain, slow down the progression of brain disease, slow down the progression of dementia, and will give you quality of life for longer. The most important thing though in all these things is actually to enjoy life. Enjoy life, enjoy life with your family. Share it with others and look forward to it. Get up each day and have a meaning for your life. Go after things which really give you an inner satisfaction. It doesn't matter how long you live in life, it's what matters is what you do with your life. So, Putting all these various things together, you see all the things that all the, the previous three speakers have said, and the overview which I've tried to give you, will give you an enjoyment of life, and you look back on, you enjoy your grandchildren, and that's really what life's all about. So thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm conscious of time, so um, uh, I want to move on to questions very quickly. So uh, please join me in saying thank you to um, Richard. And uh, Lynetta, I think we've only got time for one question. I'm sorry. So um, if you can keep it to the best question. <laughs> Well, it's a question that kind of sums up a lot of what has been said tonight, really, Richard, because how do we know which information is the information that we should be listening to and following? That's for diet, for activity, for all of those kinds of things. Is there one source that we can go to that we know is the true source or, you know, how do we know? Well, you know, um, Alzheimer's New Zealand website and they have all sorts of great information there. Uh, go, go to that website. And, and then you can just Google some of these things. But yeah, I, I, I get the point that you can have too much information. And, um, but I think look at all the areas of your life and think, how can I make sure, you know, keeping good body weight, keeping good heart, heart health, um, keeping my brain stimulated. What things which I love to do with other people, which I like to do, we we'll do more of them. Food, I think we all know what the best foods are. We've talked about that. But I think um, reaching out to your friends, to your families, to your neighbours, you know, the, and with, these, with COVID, of course, we're in lockdown, and it, it's sort of, it's a, you're all locked up together. Um, when you know, and you're separated from people, and there's actually, that's the worst thing in the world. But you can talk. We we developed in our little street here. We developed our own WhatsApp and got communication with all our neighbours and we sent notes around in the last lockdown. And now in this lockdown, we've reactivated. We we've had discussions and, and you interact in different ways. So I think you've just got to look. Everyone's environment's a bit different. And um, one thing which I didn't mention, of course, was exercising brings your body weight down and that's good. So look at what you're actual body weight is, is it the ideal? And you can do lots of things that we've suggested on how you can actually do that. So all these things put together in different ways will be 
different and applicable to different people. So then just go and enjoy life. Make sure you enjoy life. Don't make it a drudgery. Have fun. Thank you, Richard. Um, and I'm sorry to have to draw that to a close because I'm sure that um, Lynetta has some other questions that people are wanting to, point, um, uh, to put to you, but we do have to uh, finish up now. So if I can ask you just to uh, turn everything off, that would be great. Uh, and um, uh, it just remains for me to say thank you to you all for taking the time to join us tonight. Uh, thank you um, to our wonderful speakers, uh, Etu Mao, Nairi Kurs, Vanessa Berhold, and Richard Fall, um, for um, a really thoughtful and useful presentations and for keeping to time. Uh, thank you also to Lynetta for um, uh, moderating the question so well for us. Uh, just a few final comments from me. Uh, first up, I did say at the beginning that it is uh, September is World Alzheimer's Month. This year, we are asking everyone to join us in moving for dementia. So taking one of the, the tips about how we can keep ourselves healthy. Uh, also, um, if you would like to know more about uh, dementia or you would like to know how you could become a dementia friend, which will give you some tips on how to stay close to people with dementia, or you would like to join us at our conference at the end of the year, then please do go to our website. It's a wealth of information about dementia and other things there on alzheimers.org.nz. But for now, thank you so much for joining us. Ka kite anō and good night, everyone.